In this episode, we'll walk through the construction of the first of two ground antennas we used to, to track the balloon while it was in flight. The antenna we're discussing today wound up being our main one for the chase, and is called an egg beater. Wait, we're going to track our balloon with this? What? No! Egg beater here just refers to the general shape of the antenna. We're not going to use an actual egg beater. Ours ended up looking like this. Oh, okay, good. Because I love a good mad scientist routine just as much as the next girl, but you have to be a respectable mad scientist. Kitchen utensils just don't cut it. For the record, kitchen utensils were good enough for the mad scientist scene in Small Soldiers. Yeah, well, geez, as long as we're keeping up with Small Soldiers. Hey, now, don't knock it. That's a fun movie. Moving on. This one holds a special place in my heart because I got to use a drill. <laughs> so, sorry, getting a little ahead of myself. Yes, well, we primarily followed Anton Janowski's post for building this antenna. You can find that post at tinyurl.com slash eggbeater2. Our first task was to build the driven elements, which are the two rectangular loops on top. For that, we needed the following. A ruler, a sharpie marker, our needle nose pliers, and our 12 gauge solid copper wire. The driven elements would end up being rectangles that were 17 centimeters wide by 21 centimeters tall. So Dad started by cutting two lengths of wire that were each a little more than 76 centimeters long, and then straining them out with the vise. Next, he put a dot 8.5 millimeter in from each edge of the wire. This would become the first bend. He then measured 21 centimeters, then 17 centimeters, then another 21 centimeters, placing dots at each. Next, he bent the wire into the shape of the rectangle at those dots to form the first driven element. Rinse and repeat for the other driven element. Next, I measured out the two wires for the reflectors. These would each need to be 33.5 centimeters long. After that, it was time to start assembling the antenna. For the frame, we purchased a piece of PVC tubing that was 2 inches in diameter and about 2 feet long. The reflectors needed to be 33 centimeters, or 13 inches, below the driven elements, so a 2 foot piece of tubing seemed to be long enough, but still be mobile. As it turns out, Home Depot didn't have the correct sized end cap for the tube, but what they did have was the next, larger, was the next size larger caps and adapters that would allow us to friction fit them into the tube. That adapter came in handy when we went to mount the antenna to a base, as you'll see later. We also bought a package of spade connectors, which would be used to connect the driven elements to the end cap, as well as to the wiring inside. We broke out the super glue, but also bought a can of PVC cement in case we needed to keep the PVC components in place. We didn't actually end up needing this because the pieces friction fit together so well. Of course, we needed the driven elements and reflectors, and our ruler again. We started by marking the four positions where the driven elements would connect. We did this on the top first, then drew corresponding dots on the side of the cap, about three quarters of the way down. And then, oh yeah, I got to use the drill, and it was awesome. Oh geez, remind me to never let you near my circular saw. <laughs> Catherine did a fine job drilling out the four holes we would need. Now it was time to add the spade connectors. We would need one set inside the cap and one set outside the cap. These were held in place by a set of machine screws and matching nuts. I then bent the exterior connectors so they would stick straight out, perpendicular to the end cap. These would be where we would insert the driven elements. I laid the first loop on top of the end cap and marked off where the connectors would actually attach to the wire. Next, I trimmed the loops down at those spots. I repeated this process for the second loop. Then I stripped the insulation off of the ends of both loops and recruited Lucy to help me attach them. Attaching them involved inserting them into the spade connectors, crimping them down as hard as I could with my pliers, and then adding electrical tape. I also added a couple lengths of tape to where they crossed at the top to keep them centered over each other. Next, we had to wire up the insides. For that, we need two different types of coaxial cable, RG62 for the phasing line and RG58 for the lead line. Dad started with the phasing line. 
He cut off one of the BNC connectors that came with the cable and then cut an 18.5 centimeter length of cable. He then cut about 2.5 centimeters of the outer sheath off. That was the easy part. Next, I had to basically unweave the copper shielding to get at the inner insulation and wire, which was way easier said than done. This first, this first one took me over half an hour to peel back. I hope you all appreciate me compressing 30 minutes of my life into two pictures. However, if you had done a time lapse of that 30 minutes, it would have been totally awesome. I'll keep that in mind for the next time. Now that I had the inner insulation exposed, I could cut off a piece and get to the inner wire and repeated the process for the other end. Now it was time to wire up the inside of the antenna. I first bent the spade connectors to make it easier to insert the wires, and then hooked up one end of the phasing line to one loop. The inner, lo the inner wire went to one side and the outer wire to the other. I had a very difficult time crimping these connectors down to be tight enough to hold the wires in place because of the tight quarters, so I ended up soldering the ends down as well. The the lead line that would connect to our radio was next. Dad cut off one of the ends and peeled back the two layers of insulation. Of course, this one was even more difficult because of the size of the RG58 cable. Yeah, I, un I was unwinding the outer cable with a nail, and I lost half of the wires in the process because they were so small and brittle. Once I had the two wires exposed, I connected the lead line to the other end of the phasing line, inner cable to inner cable, outer to outer. I added some solder to hold it down, and then taped to the two pairs of cables to force them apart and give the combined cables some strength. When I went to attach those two ends to the other two connectors in the cap, I realized my first set of cables were still exposed, which could potentially cause a short. I added some tape to those to re-insulate them, and then inserted the other end of the phasing line, crimping the wire pairs down and applying more solder. Next I added the PVC adapter and a zip tie to keep the phasing wire from getting in the way. That just about did it for the driven elements. After that, he drilled out two sets of holes at right angles, 33 centimeters below the bottom of the driven elements. These were where the reflectors would sit. He inserted the wires he cut earlier and hot glued them in place. Now it was time to think about how we were gonna mount this thing. We knew once the reflectors were added, there wouldn't be a great way to lay this antenna down on its side so building a way for it to stand up probably would work best. He cut out a piece of really thick cardboard, like pegboard without the holes, and hot glued down the other PVC adapter to it. That would allow us to drop the antenna down onto it so we could put it in the car, on the ground, on a table, or anywhere else. We would still be able to de easily detach it and hold it up in the air if we needed to. Now it was time to put it all together. I drilled out a hole for the lead line to exit from the PVC tubing and fed the line down and through. I then attached the end cap with the driven elements to the top. I marked where the bottom of the end cap came to on the PVC tubing so that if I ever needed to take it off and adjust the wires, I could replace it to the exact same location. It was a fair amount of work, but we think the result was well worth the time. And as I said at the beginning, the egg beater was our main antenna during the chase. The signal for most of the flight came in loud and clear, even when we put the antenna in the back of the SUV and were tracking it while we were driving. So in the end, was this mad scientist enough for you? I mean, we had wires, PVC tubing, hot glue, zip ties. I will admit, it was fun seeing it to come together, but it was, and I was really impressed with how well it worked. So was I. You know, for something that was less than half electrical by weight, it certainly put up a fair amount of resistance going together. Oh, you will pay for that.